We're going to begin our after dinner program. As I said before, uh, music and the, the mirth that comes along with that is a big part of our experience at Chesterton Academy. We enjoy singing together and want to share that love of the music and that community that it builds with you for a little while tonight uh, as we lead into an opportunity to hear uh, some, some words and thoughts uh, from uh, one of our students and uh, some, some additional thoughts about the Academy and these, these young men and women. I hope you've had a great dinner with them tonight and have enjoyed this. And again, we thank you all for being here. We're going to kick off the program with uh, something that we've not done here before. One of the things that we do as a part of our PE program at Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart is ballroom dancing. And we find that it is something that uh, <clears throat> some people are resistant to a bit at first. But as they start to learn how to do this, it starts to become much more enjoyable for most of them. And it certainly gives us a way to relate to one another, and them a way to relate to one another at these different functions. There really is a purpose behind it, uh, just uh, other than something to do that's unique, different, and fun. 
And so the program tonight, uh, before we get into our, our talks later, is going to begin with a dance. And it was choreographed by one of our seniors, Elizabeth Walters. Uh, Elizabeth has been dancing here now for, for several years with us. Uh, actually, even before uh, she became a Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart student, as her brothers who were here at the school before her began learning swing dance, uh, she started to dance with them quite a bit and has become quite skillful at it. And so uh, the dance this evening is going to feature three uh, couples of students from here, including the, two of these seniors, Elizabeth, who choreographed this, along with Mr. Daniel Zalazinski, another one of our seniors, uh, who has really grown in his abilities to dance and his leadership, uh, an example that he sets forth in general. And so uh, without any further ado, we'll begin our after-dinner program of some dancing and some music before we head into our talks tonight.
hope that you start to get an inkling of the great joy and privilege it is to work with them every day. This is what we get to do every day, those of us that teach here, to work with these young men and women. And it is an honor for me to introduce this next event, this next speaker. For each gala, select one of the students to give what I really consider to be the keynote address of the evening. <clears throat> I'm going to share some more comments and some thoughts with you later, but I really do consider this next talk to be the keynote address. Uh, this next speaker is from our junior class and has distinguished himself of having great leadership. He's an excellent writer, depth of thought, very well articulated, and has a great devotion to our Lord. And these more than qualify him to deliver this next speech. And so I'm very excited to introduce to you tonight our keynote speaker for the night from the junior class of Chesterton Academy, Mr. Logan McVeigh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. I hope that this evening has been a deeply rewarding experience for each of you. It is an honor to be sharing this evening with all of you. My name is Logan McVeigh, and I'm a junior here at Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart. And tonight I wish to speak with you all a bit about the high school experience here at Chesterton. To begin with, I'd like to share a few facts about myself. I'm the oldest of eight. I've lived in four different states and I have attended eight different schools, three of which being high schools. And just in case you're wondering, no, I did not get kicked out of any of them. <laughs> Before we can evaluate the high school experience, it is necessary to first define what a high school ought to be. A high school should be a place where a student can achieve exceptional learning and guidance for becoming the best version of themselves they can be, simultaneously offering rigorous study and the opportunity to mature into adulthood, leaving behind childish behavior. We students are cursed by that title, teenager. Not because there's anything intrinsically wrong with our stage of life, at least, I hope not. <laughs> but there are many stereotypes that come along with being a teenager. One of these reasons that I believe that many teens are so corrupt in today's society is because that they are expected to live up to a certain level. And when the bar is set low, many only go to reach that bar. And few will go above and beyond what is expected of them until they are trained to seek what is higher than them. As a teenager myself, I know that I am still discovering who I am and what I'm supposed to do with the gift of life given me. And I can tell you that once you are expected to do great things, it is so much easier to achieve great things. As Chesterton students, we are placed in an environment where we are treated with great respect, and this respect is radiant throughout the school in both the students and in the teachers, whom I have had the great privilege to get to know and frequently interact with both in and out of the classroom. I've seen many different experiences in my high school years, and in each one I've had opportunities to grow in my faith, some I never took. For example, in the second half of my freshman year, I was given the opportunity to attend daily mass, adoration and weekly confession. I did attend the March for Life, but it was mostly for the experience rather than for the life-changing event as it should be. Through my fault only, I was not utilizing these gifts given me. I did participate in the choir and the chess club, and I worked hard-ish in my classes. There was homecoming, football and basketball games, prom, and other clubs throughout the school. And all of these things, which are objectively good, are what typically make up to be what we consider today to be the high school experience. As a freshman, I thought all these things were the right way and possibly even the only way. I discovered the following year that there was yet another way. I transferred to Chesterton at the beginning of my sophomore year, mostly due to the continued, continued insinuation of my mother. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> And I was honestly not all that excited. <laughs> I was still what you might call a lukewarm Catholic at the time. And I was definitely being spat out. I had little trust in those around me, and those I loved gave me little trust in return. 
The first day of my sophomore year, I stepped into the building and I had the first taste of what my parents had signed me up for. I was greeted with a handshake. <laughs> good morning, Mr. McVeigh. How are you doing today? To which I responded, uh, good. <laughs> a prompt reply followed, well, what are you good at? <laughs> this school ought to be interesting. At the beginning of my sophomore year, I retained many of my freshman ideals. I get to sing. Cool. Acting should be fun. I love to learn, and the course materials are both interesting and challenging. I get to dance. Dance. No. No, I would not. I was adamant that I would not dance, and fortunately for me, due to the restrictions in place with COVID last year, I didn't have to. Unfortunately for me, my mother had different ideas. <laughs> there was an option for learning to swing dance outside of classes, and my mother signed me up, and I did not like it. <laughs> At all. Until a few weeks later, I actually began to understand what I was doing, and I slunk home with wounded pride, confessing that I might, just maybe, enjoy dancing. Now, a year and a half and quite a few neighborhood garage dances later, I believe that dance is a crucial part of the well-rounded man because it provides key information on the cultures and customs of a society. In each of our classes, we learn not only what is essential to know, such as matters of church doctrine and first principles, we also learn how to appropriately read and dissect different written works, whether fiction or nonfiction, teaching all of us how to formulate our own opinions on any given topic. Dr. Russell recently told us during one of our literature classes that we live in a consumer society. How much can we take without doing any labor? He said that here we do not get that convenience. He said we don't get to come in and see him and take his knowledge. He told us that we are not the class, or sorry, he is not the class. Rather, we are the class. This is why we sit round table so that we can better see our peers. This is why we must contribute in the class, because we learn so many things from the insight of not only of our teachers, but from the students as well. It is true that at Chesterton, we do not have many of the normal high school opportunities. And because we're a small school, oftentimes people tend to see what we miss out on before they see what we have gained. As Catholics, we strive for something higher than comfort. Pope Benedict XVI said that you were, made for com you were not made for comfort, you were made for greatness. And we show this through our activities. We still have school dances, but we don't have homecoming or prom. Our dances are school-wide, and we learn different styles of dance, such as swing dance and the waltz. Many schools don't have this opportunity. They don't have the opportunity to start the day as a whole school with the sacrament of the mass, they don't have the opportunity to get in, or the privilege to get to know every individual student and teacher in the school personally. And this is what compels me to share with you all tonight the greatest gift that I believe this school possesses, the community. I have never met a group of teenagers who are as loyal or as steadfast in what they hold true as those sitting among you this evening. Each one of them is responsible, accountable, and trustworthy. These students can hold their own into disagreement or debate and can quickly resolve them without conflict. All of us have our faults and we seek to grow in them. And oftentimes the first to point out one of your mistakes is one of your peers, all the while giving you constructive feedback for future improvement. It is true that at Chesterton we bond differently than many other high schools. Two years ago I never thought that I would be singing songs while washing dishes on retreat with my class or spending entire nights uh, and evenings dancing with the school, or even just spending as much time as I do with my class outside of school hours. And this is what makes Chesterton so unique. The friendships I have gained here are the strongest I've ever had, and I am honored to be a part of this community. Each day I find myself working and praying with my peers, and this is the greatest gift that Chesterton has to offer. Throughout our day, we endeavor to grow in service, whether it be by helping a teacher or by complimenting a classmate. And in doing so, we are cultivating the next generation of adults. In literature class the other day, one of my classmates said something very profound. 
We are attracted to people who are sure of who they are and what they want to do with their lives. Sit on that for a second. I can tell you all that each of the, st each of the students in the school are sure of who they are and of what they want to be. These students around you know that they are children of God and that they are called to be saints. This goal is really difficult to achieve, and thus Dante tells us, if this present world has gone askew, look to yourselves. In yourselves lies the cause. It is intriguing to me that there are only two possible scenarios at your death. At your death, a final choice is made, and it is not made by God. It is made by you. That's the high school experience. That is the Chesterton difference. Thank you.
and so we'll have this a record and listen to live stream this event tonight. Thank you to Sam and Leah, and thank you for the excellent work that you do. concerned about helping you to grow in those. We want you to get to use those strengths, and we want to help you fill in those weaknesses so that you can be that best person. And I can promise you that every single one of these faculty members feels that way about you. Outside of having your parents as teachers, I'm confident that you won't find a group of teachers who care any more about you than these people. But our faculty, please stand up. You are indeed the heart and soul of this. Finally, my last thank you here, I want to thank my wife, that this is truly a shared mission for us and for our family. Uh, it would not be possible for me to do the things that I do here, uh, to invest the time, the effort, the thought into this without her and stability, the prayer and the support that she gives me and the love and the kindness and the mercy of God that she has shown me and reflected in our life and in our marriage. This would not be possible without her. And so personally, uh, I thank you for being a part of this mission.
You may have noticed our gala is a little bit different than some, that we have our students spread out here through the evening with you, sitting alongside of you, and I hope that you've really enjoyed this opportunity. I want to be very clear that this evening is not a performance. It's not a show. It's about relationships. We want you to get to know these young men and women. We want them to get to know you who have given so much to support them and support us. Those of you who have been so kind and generous in your support, we want them to know who you are and have a relationship with you. It's how we do things at Chesterton Academy. They know each other, we know them, and they know us, their teachers. Sometimes in frightening detail. <laughs> For instance, one day I wore a tie that I had not worn before. And one of the students said, uh, hey, that looks really nice, Dr. Russell. Is that new? You've never worn that before. I said, uh, thank you, Mr. Arvin. But then it happened again. <laughs> Three more times I got complimented on a tie or a shirt that I had never worn before. And then on the third time, several of the other students gathered around and they said something like, hey, yeah, and do you remember that time when you wore that brown sport coat two years ago and you only wore it one time? <laughs> Why haven't you worn that again? Oh, wow, there must be a spreadsheet documenting my wardrobe somewhere. <laughs> Trying to make me self-conscious or something. And then I said, you know what? I can have some fun with this. <laughs> so three weeks ago, out of the depths of my closet, I pulled out a beige camel hair sport coat, brown pants that looked like they were probably popular in the 1970s, and the brightest yellow shirt and tie you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I've been told I even made dinner conversations at home that night. <laughs> so the next week I tried again. Same outfit, but with orange this time. I got a similar reaction, and I found it personally tremendously entertaining to see this excitement and enthusiasm over my wardrobe. And so everybody for two Wednesdays in February, I felt like a fashion icon. Thank you. But it was only a feeling. <laughs> the students and those who know me the best should not be terribly shocked to find out that I am not a fashion icon. In fact, I don't really care that greatly about fashion, except insofar as I want our clothing to be appropriate to the dignity and purpose of the occasion and to be modest. No, I only felt that way. It was not reality. See, this is what we do every day in the classroom. We're looking for reality. We're looking for truth. Not what we feel, or not that which seems, but that which is. We have a crisis of truth and reality in our society today. It pervades our language. I was reading a news article about a high-profile court case a few months ago. And there was a quote by the juror that said, I felt the evidence was overwhelming. That's why we convicted them. We base our identity who we are on feelings and not what actually is. This actually becomes a central theme in one of the books that I'm reading, the book that I'm reading with the juniors right now, Cervantes by Miguel Cervantes, Don Quixote. Don Quixote is a story of a sort of delusional madman who thinks he's a knight errant. He thinks windmills are giant and that sheep's, sheep are armies. And he uh, attacks them violently. It's rather ridiculous, but we start to find halfway through the book that at least his intention seems to be fairly honorable. However, all of the people surrounding him 
start to play along with the game out of their own entertainment. They start to have fun, making fun of the madman, and they play along. They play along saying things are not what they are and pretending that they're something different in order to have a great time with Don Quixote, so much so that one character rides in and witnesses this and says this, I quote, I conceive there must be some mystery in thus insisting upon a thing so contrary to truth and experience. Conceive there must be some mystery in thus insisting upon a thing so contrary to truth and experience. How often could I say things, that very same thing, about the things going on around us in the world today? We seek and endeavor to make the pursuit of truth a habit. I'm not terribly convinced that anyone will remember any one particular thing that I say tonight or in any one particular lecture or any one particular conversation in the classroom, but I am quite confident that if I keep saying it and we teachers keep saying it and we keep doing it and modeling it and we make it a habit for our students to do these things, it will be remembered. And it will not only be remembered as a habit, but it will be integrated into the character of our students. If we constantly seek the meaning of the text that the author is trying to tell us, that will become a habit, an intellectual habit, a character habit of fortitude. And we'll start to apply it to the world around us, and we'll find that not only are there authors of text, but there's a divine author. In the book Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton marvels at the fact that daisies are all the same and that everybody has noses, and it seems like a conspiracy that that would happen. That the fact that the sun rises and sets every single day seems like magic, and if there is magic, there must be a magician. If there's a meaning, there must be someone to mean it. Yes, indeed, when we sincerely seek the truth, we're going to find it. We're going to find parts of it, and if we continue to find those parts and pick them up and piece them together, it's eventually going to lead us to the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we start to find that there is a meaning. There's a meaning to all around us. There's a meaning to our lives, a purpose for each and every one of us. And we help, hope to help our students find that. And part of that is knowing them so well. In our previous galas, I started a tradition, a tradition of recognizing an attribute, a positive attribute or attributes of our incoming freshman class. However, we had to cancel our gala in 2020, a week before the event, and so our juniors never got the opportunity to hear that. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to speak about each and one of our juniors, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way than I did it in the past. You see, going back to Don Quixote, when Don Quixote becomes a knight, he changes his name. He gets a name, a special knight name. And he names the lady, a special lady name. And my students a few weeks ago said, Dr. Russell, we're giving you assignment to give us knight and lady names. And uh, seeing as they have no authority to give me assignments, I didn't do it. <laughs> but they kept asking and begging. And so, juniors, tonight you're going to get it in front of 180 people. <laughs> If I could have, ask Miss Brom to stand, please. Miss Brom. Miss Brom is the lady of monotonous reliability. <laughs> she gets that name because she is extraordinarily competent and reliable in all the things she does. She is confident in her leadership and confident in the authority she has when she is in a leadership position. And furthermore, she has great, tremendous even, fortitude. I find that I can come to Ms. Brom with a very difficult task and say, Ms. Brom, can you do this? And I can spin out one of the most difficult tasks. And she looks at me and she goes, yes. And she's always right. Ms. Brom is the lady of monotonous reliability. I'm going to ask Mr. McVeigh to stand, please. <laughs> Mr. McVeigh is the knight of confident devotion. He gets that name because he is deeply devoted to seeking God and he is confident 
in the truth of God's revelation. This confidence in God's revelation, who God is and who he made him to be, allows him to be confident himself. And he can, therefore, confidently call others out with some fraternal correction, which he does, and then call them up. I appreciate that example and that leadership, Mr. McVeigh. You're welcome. I'd like to ask Ms. Ramirez to stand, please. Ms. Ramirez. Ms. Ramirez is a lady of bold tenacity. <laughs> when she has an idea that would have a positive impact on others or on the school, she keeps pushing it and pursuing it. She makes sure that it is not forgotten, that it's not lost in the shuffle. I've seen that in her desire to create a chapel for the school lately. And that's just one example of how she does this. I also know that she gets the boldness from the fact that she's not afraid to boldly speak out in her opinions and in the truth, even if that truth or opinion is not the popular one. I appreciate that boldness and that willingness to do that, Mr. Ramirez. I'd like to ask Ms. Sophia Quartz to stand, please. Ms. Sophia Quartz. Don Quixote is named in the book the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, the Knight of the Sorrowful, Sad, Pitiful Countenance. If Don Quixote is the Knight of the Rueful Face, the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, Ms. Quartz is the Lady of the Sunny Countenance. Ms. Quartz has a cheerful, upbeat disposition and attitude, even in the midst of great personal trials or environmental challenges around her, which represents a great fortitude and willingness to keep her eyes on that joy and happiness. I see this all the time in the choir and her active participation there. I see it in other places. And she, in the midst of hardship, doubles down on her infectious enthusiasm and readily spreads it to other people within school. Thank you for that influence, Ms. Quartz. Ms. Walters, Ms. Teresa Walters. That's right. Ms. Teresa Walters. She actually gave me a night name. You know that? She gave me a night name. She called me, it was something like the night with like, no sympathy or something like that. <laughs> I've got this sympathy pocket. You see, it's where I keep my sympathy, and it's usually empty. <laughs> anyway, if I'm the knight of no sympathy, she's the lady of ample sympathy. She has a great concern for others who are hurting or who are suffering, who are in pain, having challenges and trials. She has less tolerance for that for herself, though. She has a great desire to be personally, morally strong and upright. It's a great example in that. And incidentally, one other skill, she's a great dramatic writer. So much so that the way she begins her essays has dubbed the people in her class to say, hey, did you do that thing? She's a great writer, but has a great concern for others. I appreciate that, Ms. Walters. <laughs> Ms. Olson, Ms. Cecilia Olson. Ms. Olson is the lady of quiet leadership. Her name may seem like a bit of a paradox, but it's true. Though she is very quiet, she has very high standards and very high expectations for those around her. And I'm convinced that people know that they should act better and be better just from her presence. I know that Ms. Olson herself is very pious, but she has a delightful sense of sometimes sarcastic humor. <laughs> but she's also extraordinarily generous frequently bringing various treats, exotic fruits to share, and all of the kinds of things with enthusiasm that she just wants to introduce to somebody else. I appreciate that leadership, Ms. Olson. <laughs> Ms. Twait. Ms. Twait is the lady of boisterous mirth and humor.
This tweet brings extraordinary amounts of energy and excitement to all of her endeavors. She approaches these endeavors, performances, and so forth with a tremendous enthusiasm that makes other people want to come along for the ride and, and, and work on this project as well. Ecstatic laughter and humor is something that follows Ms. Tweet around quite frequently, and it brings a lot of joy to the classroom. Thank you, Ms. Tweet. I have two more additions that came a little bit later than the others. Ms. Bober, would you stand, please? Uh, Ms. Bober uh, joined us as a, as a junior at the school, and Ms. Bober is the lady of exuberant kindness. It didn't take very long when she showed up to notice her extroverted, exuberant enthusiasm that brings an air of excitement to all of the endeavors in which she's pursuing and that we pursue with her. But when she showed up, I also noticed an increase in demonstrations of gratitude. It was an increase of thank you notes and posters and acts of kindness to other people, random acts of kindness that demonstrate a great, enthusiastic, exuberant concern for others. Thank you, Ms. Bomer. And finally, our latest addition to the junior class at Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart is Ms. Patricia Awada. Patricia, would you please stand, Ms. Awada? <laughs> Ms. Awada transferred into Chesterton Academy halfway through the first semester of junior year this past fall. Uh, she was and is a great gift to the school. She transferred here from Lebanon, where she was taking classes in Arabic and French. Being a little bit less uh, comfortable with English, it was an exciting uh, endeavor for her to jump right into the middle of Dante's Divine Comedy. <laughs> Something that would be a hard enough task for someone who is fully fluent in English. However, she stuck with it very firmly and very strongly. If she complained, which she very, very rarely did, she would berate herself for complaining while she was complaining. And I'll tell you, she never once missed an assignment. She is the lady of skillful fortitude. She has fortitude and she has great skill. She's been a great example to the other students and she brings a tremendous amount of joy uh, to, to all of us around her. She's an impressive example. Thank you, Ms. Awana. In John Paul II's letter to families, he talks about how we all have a personal finality, that we all have a purpose to our lives that is unique to us. Dogs have sort of a dogness about them. But we don't have just a sort of humanness about us. We have a personal calling and an end to our own life. It's true for every single one of us. It's true for every single one of our students. It is a reality. And it is imperative that we know them well and that we know God well, that we can find that personal finality. As I close my remarks this evening and invite Mr. Brom to, to, to the stage here, I want to leave you with one more reality. I would like for all of the Chesterton students to just stand up for one moment. This is a reality, that in 20 years or so, these students are going to be sitting in our seats. They are going to be leading our businesses. They are going to be leading our communities and our country. They are going to be leading our churches and our schools, and they might be deciding how to raise their children and where to send them to school. After spending the evening with these young men and women, having dinner with them, hearing some words of theirs, and seeing them perform, I hope that you can see that they are doing their part to fulfill that well. That they are doing their part to lead with maturity, with courage, with honor. Working with you, students, has been the greatest professional joy and honor of my life. 
you give me great hope for the future. I thank you all for that. And I thank all of you here for making that future and that hope possible. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Russell. First, I uh, want to introduce myself. I'm Jaron Brom. I'm a member of the board of Chester Academy of the Sacred Heart. And want to just start the, the remarks this evening by introducing you to the rest of the board. Uh, so if you don't mind standing when I call your name and we'll recognize everybody together. So Matt and Laura Bober. Uh, Dan Myers, I know I saw Dan, there he is. And Tim Olson over here on my left. And last but certainly not least, this lovely lady that I met at a Panera Bread one day a long time ago, Michelle Brown. <laughs> This team works tirelessly behind the scenes, and I appreciate you joining me and, and thanking them for all the work that they do for the students and the faculty and the families of Chesterton. <laughs> Next, since uh, Dr. Russell had his turn at recognizing the junior class this year, I wanted to take a moment to roast, I'm sorry, I mean, um, toast <laughs> Dr. Russell. <laughs> you may be surprised to learn that Dr. Russell is an exceptional pianist with a doctorate in piano performance. He could be considered the knight of piano performance. He's also a certified flight instructor with credentials in commercial, single, and multi-engine aircraft with instrument ratings, as well as a private helicopter pilot. So he could be considered the knight of flight. <laughs> as if that were not enough, he happens to be the longest serving headmaster of the 45 schools in the Chesterton Schools Network. Now, I just want to be clear that that doesn't necessarily mean he's the oldest <laughs> or the best dressed. <laughs> but we're very happy to have him. But lastly, and I would say most importantly, he is a serious disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes him a great headmaster. So, if you could join me in a toast to thank Dr. Russell and his wife Anna for all of the work and support that they have provided to the families and the students and the faculty of Chesterton over the six years that we've been here. So, thank you, Dr. Russell. My father, who is here tonight, taught me to never come to a podium without a drink. I just think he usually drank water. But. So that brings me to what Mr. McVeigh already introduced you to, which is the Chesterton difference. There are six hallmarks of a Chesterton school, and tonight I want to focus on three of them. The first Chesterton difference is that we're focused on the incarnation. From history and theology to math and science, the incarnation is the central mystery 
that we explore across the entire curriculum. It's our greatest hope that each student who comes to Chesterton experiences the reality of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It's really that simple. The second Chesterton difference is the focus on the transcendentals, on truth, goodness, and beauty. Our classical curriculum combines a broad liberal arts education with a strong emphasis on the development of Christian virtues and the appreciation of beauty. And the third Chesterton difference, which I hope that you have all experienced tonight, is joy. The true joy when the community centered on the incarnation and the pursuit of virtue, the students experience the great joy of authentic community. And it provides them with the opportunity to grow intellectually, morally, and spiritually to become who God created them to be. Education is one of the most important things we can give our children. We can't settle for second best for them. We can't give them a partial expression of what they need. We want to teach them how to be truly happy and how to integrate all aspects of their life through their faith. To be successful, sure, but more importantly, to be great. To be great people, to be faithful to what the Lord is calling them to, and to persevere. By integrating faith and reason in a Catholic classical education, we impart the full vision of the reality of being made in the image and likeness of God, uniting the formation of the mind and soul. And only this gives them the basis of true happiness, which is not only the goal of education, but of life itself. And so if this is a mission that you are passionate about, I invite you to partner with us on this mission. As a small private school, it's our goal to make this amazing education affordable for all of our families. As a result, our tuition, which is only $5,400 per year, only covers about 54% of the actual cost of educating our students. That means we have to raise the other 46% through your generous support. As Chesterton says, any dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. And boy, does our culture and our world really need students like these, willing and able to go against the current. So we have a couple opportunities tonight to make the most of your generosity. First of all, because of the generosity of our sponsors, the cost of this evening is already covered. So there's no, we don't charge a ticket fee to come in and, and have dinner with us. So everything that you donate tonight, 100% goes towards supporting and funding the school for next year. Second, thanks to a generous matching donation, we have the opportunity to double every gift made tonight up to $40,000. So your gift of $2,500 becomes $5,000. And I should also mention, if any Caterpillar employees are here tonight, we have the chance to triple that with the cat match. So your gift of 2,500 might become 7,500. Now, as I walk you through the logistics here, I want to invite Ms. Brahm up as she'll play some music for us. But at each table, there are a number of pledge cards in the middle. Should look a, a bit like this. And you can either include a, a check tonight in the envelope. You can scan this QR code on the back and pay by credit card. Or you can sign up to make a monthly donation. Or you can just note your pledge on the card if you want to send your gift in at a later date. Once you complete the card, you place it in the envelope. And we have a few students who will be walking around to collect those and pick them up. And for those who are watching on the live stream, I think you'll have the opportunity to click on a link in the live stream and make a donation through that as well. So as I close, I want to propose a final toast to the students and the families of Chesterton Academy of the Sacred Heart. Here's to the Chesterton difference. May we always have the courage to swim against the current. 
Cheers.
Duncan, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for your great generosity. Thank you very much. Truly the highest form of thought. We thank you and, and can't thank you enough for being here and for, for being a part of this evening here. As we uh, close the evening out, uh, we're going to have a, a final prayer and blessing here, followed by a, um, our, what is uh, our school song that started the first year uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as an Ave Maria in three parts. It was something that we could sing that first year, and we have continually brought this back for event after event, and our students were asking today. I hadn't originally planned us doing that, but kept asking, well, we've got to sing that. We have to sing that. And so as we come to that time, uh, I'm soon going to, to uh, invite Father Hugh to, to give us a, a closing prayer and blessing and, and, and sing. So students, feel free to come on and make your way up to here, uh, to the front. But I do, once again, want to thank all of our sponsors this evening. Thank you to those uh, program sponsors, Lakeview Veterinary Clinic, to Baker McKenzie, the Wigan family. Uh, thank you to all of you for your generous donations and supporting this evening and all of the businesses that have supported us. I want to thank uh, two last people as well, um, members of our faculty and staff that have put in a tremendous amount of time behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, one of those is Mr. Tyler Smith, our director of uh, recruiting and our director uh, of development. I want to thank him for the countless hours that he's put in to make this evening possible tonight. So thank you to Mr. Smith. And then finally, thank you to our administrative assistant, Mrs. Higgins, uh, for all of the work that she's put in uh, with jockeying uh, seating lists and guest lists and so forth. Uh, thank you for all of the time that you have invested. <laughs> this time, I'll invite Father Hugh Mary to come forward to give us a closing prayer of blessing this evening uh, before we sing our final Ave Maria. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we give you thanks to you, O Lord, for gathering us. Outpour your blessings upon those families during this Lenten season where we want to renew. According to the spirit we receive tonight, our desire is to be saints, to walk in your presence all our life, to welcome your gift, your grace, to be holy according to your divine plan on each one of us. We want to turn our gaze to the Virgin Mary tonight with this singing we are going to have with the students in order that this Lenten season could be lived with you, Mary, our mother, who wants to be so present at Chesterton Academy with us to grow in our person, mm -hmm. to grow in our uh, relationship with one another. We thank you, our mother, to gather us tonight. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given. Jesus Christ, his son, give thanks. And may Almighty God bless you through the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Thank you again. Thank you again to all of you for coming this evening. It's great to have you here, and I hope that you will join us uh, for the rest of the, uh, the evening as we begin our uh, swing dance tonight. We certainly invite you to join us. Hope you've had a wonderful evening with our students, and uh, let's hit it.